In the last video, we saw that my biological age using Dr. Morgan Levine's biological age calculator, PhenoAge, was about 15 years younger than my chronological. Similarly, when using aging.ai, it was about 21 years younger. So in today's video, we'll take a look at what may be contributing to these data. So first, let's start off with supplements. And if you're familiar with the channel, the first two shouldn't be a surprise. So first, I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism in my early to mid 20s. So I've been taking levothyroxine ever since then, so about half my life. And for this test, it was 137 and a half micrograms of levothyroxine per day. For, for the second supplement, vitamin D, I supplemented with 2,000 IUs per day, and I used a higher dose than I did for a previous test, but I'll get to that in, in a second. So first note that I took it for 47 of the 49 days that corresponded to this blood test. So what does that mean? So starting from immediately after test number six, which was on October 9th of 2023, through the day before testing on for blood test number seven, November 26th of 2023, that's a 49-day period. So for that 49-day period, I have an average dietary intake, average supplement intake, which I then line up with blood biomarkers to look at correlations with the diet and the supplements, and then tailor my diet to try to optimize the biomarkers towards youth and health in terms of all-cause mortality risk. Now, getting back to that vitamin D dose of 2,000 IUs per day, I doubled it from where it usually is, around 1,000 or 1,000 supplemental uh, IUs of vitamin D per day, and I did that in part or mostly because of the correlations with biomarkers, and I'll get into the what that means exactly a little, a little bit more later in this video. So for two of those biomarkers, vitamin D was inversely and significantly correlated with lower levels. For example, a relatively higher vitamin D intake was significantly correlated with lower creatinine as a marker of kidney function. And you can see that that p-value is less than 0.05, and that N is over 47 blood tests, or 47 blood tests since uh, I started tracking all of this in 2015. Similarly, a relatively higher vitamin D intake is was also significantly inversely correlated with glucose levels. So higher vitamin D was correlated significantly correlated with lower glucose. And that's over 45 tests since, again, 2015. So rather than looking at correlations, I directly tried to test that by doubling my usual 1,000 IUs of vitamin D per day to 2,000. And note that over that, uh, since 2015, I haven't gone above 2,000 IUs per day. So in that data, having when I've had I, uh, vitamin D intakes of a 2,000 IUs per day supplemental, creatinine and glucose have been lower. So I tested that hypothesis, and unfortunately, creatinine and glucose did not improve. So that's a correlation. It's not causation, at least in the case for vitamin D. So with that in mind, for the next test, test number one in 2024, I'll return to my 1,000 IUs of vitamin D per day, knowing it didn't impact the biomarkers, or at least these two big ones at all. For the third supplement, methyl B12, 1,000 uh, micrograms of vi uh, methyl B12 per day, and that's for 49 of all 49 of the 49 days that corresponded to this blood test. So for every day during this period that corresponded to the test, I supplemented with methyl B12, and I did that to limit homocysteine, as B12 is the only variable of folate, choline, B6, even serine that's been uh, uh, that's made an impact on keeping my homocysteine lo uh, levels lower than they could be without supplementation. But also, uh, B12 intake, in my case, is significantly correlated right now, after I think uh, nine tests, with a lower Horvath epigenetic age. So I'll keep that in the approach. I don't yet have the Horvath data from that corresponds on this day, as I also sent blood for epigenetic analysis. So hopefully that stays relatively low, in part potentially caused by methyl B12. So for now, methyl B12 stays in the approach based on its potential positive effects on these two biomarkers. And for the fourth and last supplement, I, I used nicotinic acid, 60 milligrams per day. Again, a very low dose relative to where, where I've been for higher doses. I've supplemented with as much as 600 milligrams of nicotinic acid per day with a potential uh, bad effect on the epigenetic pace of aging, Dunedin pace. So that's why I'm now down to the lower doses. Now, for this test, it was only for 23 of the 49 days. As I'm trying to find the dose that I can get an NAD boost without potentially messing up the epigenetic pace of aging, if nicotinic acid really is causative in that uh, in that role, I, I just sent. Uh, I intend on sending more NAD uh, tests in conjunction with epigenetic testing to find that nicotinic acid dose where I can uh, maximize NAD without potentially impacting. Uh, epigenetic pace of aging. So nicotinic acid, supplement number four. But that's it. No other senolytics or GR protectors. Which then brings us to diet. More specifically, what diet composition corresponds to test number seven or this blood test? 
And that's what we'll see here. This is the average daily dietary intake over that 49 day period that corresponds to this blood test. So first we can see the top 24 foods. And if you're familiar with the channel, you know I rank them in order from highest intake in grams to the lowest at the bottom with the exception of green tea, which is listed in ounces. And I don't know if I've mentioned this uh, in a while. I haven't mentioned this in a while, but I, the green tea that I use is not tea bags. I use organic loose leaf green tea sourced from Japan as there are studies, uh, all cause mortality data coming from Asia, Japan, and China showing that relatively higher intakes of green tea or drinking green tea is associated with a reduced all cause mortality risk. So that's why green tea is basically a staple in my diet. So if you're interested in measuring or, or using the green tea that I use and getting it from where I get it from, there's a discount link in the video's description. All right, so for the second half of the diet, that's what we can see here. Again, ranking them in terms of highest intake to lowest. And then we can see that I ate 47 different foods that corresponded uh, to the 49 day period during this test. Now, a question I often get is why are the foods that I have at the top, why are they at the top? So let's just go into that a little bit. So as I mentioned, I use correlations for diet with the blood biomarkers. In this case, the uh, biomarker list includes 25 different biomarkers. Most of them are blood-based, but I do include slow wave sleep and systolic blood pressure as two non-blood-based biomarkers in terms of their correlations with diet. Now, for those 25 biomarkers, I have data for 9 to 33 tests since 2018. As I just started tracking food in 2018, I have data for macros and micros that goes back even further, though, to 2015. So most of the data, though, is closer to 30 tests. Uh, I only have a couple of biomarkers with very little data. For example, uh, nine tests for systolic blood pressure, 10 for DHEA sulfate, with the remainder pretty close to 33 um, tests for each of those remaining 23 biomarkers. So strawberries have a plus 11 correlative score and significant in terms of a p-value less than 0, 0 0.05 with those 25 biomarkers. So what that means is strawberries are significantly correlated with 11 biomarkers, a net of 11 biomarkers going in the right direction versus the wrong in terms of how they look to, uh, during aging and their association with all-cause mortality risk. In other words, if strawberries were inversely associated with uh, or inversely correlated with blood pressure, that would be a good thing because blood pressure increases during aging. So that would get a plus one score. Conversely, if strawberries were positively correlated with blood pressure, that would be going in the wrong direction because blood pressure increases during aging. So I would give that a negative one score. In the case of strawberries, they have a plus 11 score. So they are one of the strongest, have, uh, they're one of the foods that have one of the strongest net correlative scores in my data in terms of their correlation with the biomarkers. So that's why they're at the top. Now, in terms of their average intake, since 2018, since I started tracking food intake, 407 grams per day. When a food has a positive score, I eat, I purposely aim for above my average intake. So we can see that I'm following that correlation as strawberry intake for this test was about 600 grams per day. All right, so next up are collard greens. And using the same approach, uh, correlations for foods with the 25 biomarkers, collard greens have it also a pretty strong score of plus seven. Seven biomarkers going in the right direction or a net of seven biomarkers going in the right direction versus wrong. So their average intake since I started tracking food intake is 84 grams per day. To follow the correlation, I aim for above average intake. So we can see that about 300 grams per day is a lot higher than that average of 84 grams per day. So I'm following that correlation too. But then to illustrate one that I'm not following the correlation are, is carrot intake at a relatively high amount of 259 grams per day average for this test. Carrots have a net correlative score of zero. That means that there's an equal number of biomarkers going the right direction uh, versus wrong in terms of the correlation with carrots. So in that case, I aim for average intake, uh, which is 353 grams since 2018. So we can see that 259 is less than 353. So technically, I'm not following that correlation. So why? So as we'll see later, uh, beta carotene has a net correlative score of minus four. So I aim for my below average intake there. So if I was to increase carrot intake to meet that correlation to 353 grams per day, because there's such a rich source of beta carotene, I'd have to cut other beta carotene rich foods like the collard greens, which have a score of plus seven. So for now, knowing that collard greens have a plus seven score and carrots have a zero score, I keep the collards high while keeping the carrots a bit below their average intake. So following, you know, it's, it's following more of one to limit, uh, the other with the carrot intake. And I'll explain more about the beta carotene story a little bit later in the macro and micro section of this of this video. All right, so were there any experiments for this test? Did I try to use foods to impact any biomarkers? And I did. 
and that involved egg intake. So if you saw the biological or uh, blood test number six test, 2023, you saw that I included two eggs per week because eggs are a rich source of choline to try to impact homocysteine. So choline is converted into betaine, trimethylglycine, homocysteine plus betaine yields methionine, thereby reducing homocysteine. So a higher egg intake, higher choline intake potentially could reduce homocysteine. So I wanted to try that experiment, starting with two eggs per week for the last blood test. So I, for this test, I doubled egg intake to an average of about four eggs per week. Uh, and again, that's with the goal of reducing homocysteine, but uh, without showing the homocysteine data, it stayed relatively high at 9.8 micromolar, so that didn't work. So for now, I've cut the eggs out until I find or until I get the epigenetic data, especially when considering that choline feeds into methylation pathways. It's possible that that doubling of egg intake with the higher choline intake could have impacted Horvath or Dunedin Pace. And I don't yet have that data. I'm waiting on it. It should be a couple more weeks. Based on how that goes, I may reintroduce eggs back into the diet. All right, so then what about cheat days? So the diet is purposefully not always clean. I try to limit the cheat days or cheat meals to at most no more than two. If I go above that, I start thinking about junk and craving junk, and that's just bad news in terms of long-term dietary adherence, at least in my case. I found that no more than two cheat meals allows me to be satiated with some junk while keeping me on track for all the other days when I don't have any junk until the next day when I do have junk. So for this test, those two cheat, two cheat meals involved the standard, if you've seen the videos in this series for my diet, diet composition videos, you know that I'm a big fan of chocolate mix and peanut butter. So I did that again for this test. Immediately after test number seven, uh, I had ch chocolate mix with peanut butter, uh, homemade Reese's peanut butter cup, which was delicious. And then I did that on a second day, but then I also had some candy, Starburst to be exact. So when calculating the, the calories from these two junk foods or you know the ch chocolate chips and the Starburst, it comes out to 9.55 for the chocolate and 3.99 for the Starburst. And when adding that together and dividing that by the total amount of calories consumed during that 49-day period, it comes out to 1.3% of all calories were from junk for this test. So the diet is pretty close to 99% clean and 1% junk. All right, so this list is ranked in grams. Which foods are top contributors for calories? And that's what we can see here. And note that these data are generated by Chronometer, which is what I use to track my diet. If you want to track your diet using Chronometer, there'll be a discount link in the video's description. So in terms of the food where I get the majority of my calories, it's from sardines. And that's been true for many videos. As sardines have a very positive net correlative score. And I won't show that data in this video. I may show that in an upcoming video. A quick shout out to, I've been including the correlations with diet on Patreon in a new tier, so you may want to check that out if you're interested in the full breakdown of foods, macros, and micros with those 25 biomarkers. So the for the other 10 foods on this list, it's the, exactly the same as what I had for test number six, as the blood biomarkers are mostly youthful, so I'm not trying to be inconsistent with the diet or completely blow up the diet or have a very variable diet. I'm trying to keep the diet mostly consistent with some very small tweaks to try to improve some of the weak spots like homocysteine or Horvath, or even try to length, trying to lengthen telomere length. So same 10 foods as for test number six, albeit in a slightly different um, uh, order. All right, so what about macronutrients? What macronutrient composition corresponds to test number seven? So starting with uh, calorie intake or energy, average daily calorie intake for the 49 day period that corresponded to this test was 2106. And I know you've probably heard me say this a lot for every test for about the past two years, but 2106 is my lowest average daily calorie intake. Sequentially, every test I've been purposely lowering it just by a small amount. So this is my lowest average daily calorie intake since I started tracking diet in uh, 2015, uh, actually macros and micros in 2015. And the previous low before that was for test number six, 2122 calories per day. In terms of protein intake for this test, the 49 day average was about 96 grams per day. So why that amount? Where am I getting that amount from? In terms of protein intake's correlation with those 25 biomarkers, protein has a net correlative score of minus four. My average protein intake since I started tracking macros and micros in 2015 is 110 grams per day. So to follow the correlation, I aim for below average intake when the score is negative, hence the 96 grams versus the 110 grams per day. In terms of the percentage of calories from the diet that the protein provides, it's about 18%. All right, so next up, fat intake. And that's what we can see here. Average daily fat intake for the 49-day period that corresponded to this test, 81 grams per day. So why that amount? Where did I get that amount? For that, we go to the correlations with blood biomarkers or the 25 biomarkers. 
and fat has a net correlative score of minus one. So again, one a net of one biomarker going in the wrong direction versus right in terms of those tw- the list of 25 and significant with a p-value less than 0.05. So my average fat intake since 2015 is 85 grams per day. Again, when the correlation is negative, I aim for below average intake. So 81 is below 85, so I'm following the correlation. In terms of the percentage of calories, fat contributed about 35% of the total calories in my diet. And if you're interested in how that fat breakdown goes into mono and polyunsaturated, omega-3, omega-6, and so on down the list, you can see that here. And as a quick note about chronometer, it does have a glitch. You can see that the when you add the mono, poly, and all of the fats that are on the list, it doesn't add up to 81 grams. And that's because although chronometer uh, provides the total fat amount for at least two of the foods in my diet, uh, cocoa beans and sardines, it doesn't provide some of the further breakdown for monounsaturated fat, for example. So there's about a 20 gram deficit in between adding up what you see on the list and the 81 grams. But that's a systematic error. My diet is mostly consistent, so I'm not too worried about those two foods. Uh, having and chronometer having about a 20 gram shortfall. All right, next up, carb intake, which is what we can see here. Total carbs, 287 grams, 49 day average for this test. Again, which seems like a lot, and I know I've said that in uh, earlier iterations of this video series, but note that net carbs equals carbs minus fiber. Average fiber intake for this test was about 80, was 82 and a half grams per day. So when we subtract that from total carbs, we get a net carbs of about 205 grams per day. When multiplying that by four calories per gram, we can see that net carbs provide about 39% of total calories. Now, also within carbs, I don't uh, look at correlations for total sugars, but I do look at correlations for total fructose, and that's because the diet is rich in vegetables and fruit, which have fructose. For example, beets and carrots have a lot of fructose. Strawberries have a lot of fructose. And fructose has a net negative correlative score, although I won't go into it in uh, into that in this video, which is why I keep an eye on it to keep it relatively low. So total fructose, when looking at fructose plus sucrose divided by two as sucrose is half fructose, total fructose was 58 grams per day, which seems like a lot. But again, I've mentioned this in earlier videos, that's close to my lowest fructose intake since I started tracking it in 2015, which was 57 and a half grams. Now, I've also mentioned this in earlier videos, I've had fructose intakes double this amount that corresponded to blood tests So this is a small win to have a fructose intake, about half of that. All right, now also note that soluble fiber as a component of the total fiber category is fermented by gut bacteria into short chain fatty acids or SCFAs. So in other words, fiber provides some calories that can be included into net macros. And those calories are about two calories per gram of fiber, yielding 175 calories from fiber, about 8% of the total calories in the diet that can be added to total fat. And with that in mind, we can then see that my net macros would adding the fiber calories, 8.3%, again, which can be included to uh, added to the fat column. Total fat is about 43%, net carbs, 39%, and total protein is about 18%. All right, so what about micronutrients? So let's start off with vitamins, and it may be hard to see. I wanted to get all of them on the list. Uh, so you may have to go full screen if you haven't already to see all of the little numbers because it's probably a uh, small font. Now, a couple of things to note is that there is full RDA coverage for anyone starting on this approach with the goal of optimizing both biomarkers and, and using diet to do that. Uh, a good starting point is to at least make sure you get full RDA coverage. Now, how far you should go above the, the RDA, uh, for me, relies on the correlations with the blood biomarkers as many micronutrients on this list are purposely higher. So to illustrate two of those, let's take a look at vitamin K, which has a plus five score. And you can see that my vitamin K intake is uh, about 2,400 micrograms per day. Now the RDA, or what's considered an adequate intake, is about 100 micrograms. So I'm about 24X the RDA. Now that's not uh, um, by accident. That's intentional because vitamin K has a plus five net correlative score with those 25 biomarkers. So we can see that my average is significantly uh, below that. So I aim for above average intake with a positive five net correlative score to follow the correlation. Conversely, we can see that beta carotene in in my data has a net correlative score of minus four. So if I were, again, as I mentioned earlier, if I were to increase carrot intake, that would raise my beta carotene levels uh, and that would not be following the beta carotene correlation and I'd be cutting collard greens, which would, would, 
when considering they have a plus seven score, I'd be potentially weakening whatever effect they may have on blood biomarkers or mostly blood biomarkers of those 25. So beta carotene has an average intake of about 53,000 micrograms or 53 milligrams since 2015. To follow the correlation, I aim for below average intake since the net score is negative. So I'm following it. As you can see, the 50,000 micrograms or 50 milligrams of beta carotene is below the 53,000 milligram average. All right, what about mineral intake? And that's what we can see here. Now, what, what I'd like to highlight about mineral intake is comparing it to test number six. And we can see the full mineral intake as shown there. Now, note that if you go through the list, test six versus test number seven on the right, you can see that it's purposely consistent. And as I mentioned earlier, the goal is not to blow up the whole system. It's to, it's to stay mostly consistent and make very small changes in targeted areas based on the correlations for diet with the blood biomarkers. So just to illustrate, just to reiterate, test number six mineral intake, very pur uh, purposely similar to test number seven as shown on the right. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And I should mention on Patreon, I've added a couple more tiers, including early, or I've added things to tiers too, including early ad-free video access. So on YouTube, you've got uh, probably ads like crazy, ad-free videos uploaded a day before, at least a day in advance on Patreon. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, I established a new tier with biomarker correlations with diet including macros, micros, and foods with the 25 biomarkers that I just showed in this video. And then once the epigenetic, telomere, and metabolomic data comes in, I'll put those correlations on Patreon too. We've also got discount links. So if you're interested in that, check it out. Discount links for epigenetic and telomere testing, NAD quantification, oral microbiome composition, at-home metabolomics, uh, at-home blood testing with SciFox Health, which includes ApoB, diet tracking, green tea, which I mentioned earlier, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee. We've also got merch. So if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Die Trying brand, which is what I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.